First at nine. Headlines. It's the 22nd of April 2014. A very good evening to all our viewers and welcome to the News at Nine. Come to you live from the News First Centre here in Colombo. I'm Joel Outskoon with tonight's headlines. The inaugural sitting of the 6th Western Provincial Council was held today. Sunil Vijayaratna appointed as chairman. Office trains delayed due to a protest by a group of railway employees. Train services restored. Granting of compensation of soybean farmers in Hurulwaba postpones yet again. Paul Fabres tenders in his resignation as head coach of SLC. Let's now cross over to our news for studios for a comprehensive news bulletin. Well, thank you, Joel, for bringing us tonight's headlines. Hello there and welcome to Primetime News from the News First Studios in Colombo. I'm Nadim Majid. Good evening, I'm Mahila Bongzo. We start off with a look at stories making headlines here at home. A tense situation was reported at the Fort Railway Station this evening. The situation arose due to a demonstration organized by casual workers attached to the Department of Railways demanding that their positions be made permanent. The railway's control room said that the demonstration resulted in the delay of trains operating along the main railway line and the coastal line. The trains operating on the coastal line were the most affected. The railway's control room went on to note, as the casual workers of the department engaged in the demonstration on the tracks, the Rohunukumari train failed to depart on time. The demonstration hindered the operations of a number of office trains this evening. Commuters were severely inconvenienced due to this demonstration. Superintendent of Railway Operations, L.A.R. Rotnaika, noted that the police later intervened to disperse the protesters and that services resumed in keeping with the schedule. Come on, 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 come on,
The police intervened and allowed the trains to operate on the tracks that were obstructed by the demonstrators. The police arrived here and removed all the railway employees who were protesting. Subsequently, trains resumed operations. News first train went. Mama Manjula Pem Ratna. What do you think of the also in local news, the maiden sitting of the 6th Western Provincial Council was held today at the Western Provincial Council Auditorium in Batramulla. Let's take a look at the day's proceedings. The maiden sitting of the 6th Western Provincial Council was held today under the auspices of the Governor of the province, Alavi Maulana. The first order of business was the swearing-in of councillors who did not take oaths before the Governor. UNP Western Provincial Councillor Royce Fernando, who is in remand custody, was also sworn in today. The Secretary of the Provincial Council then presented the convening notice of the 6th Provincial Council on behalf of the Governor. The next order of business was the election of the Chairman of the Council. The Government proposed the name of Sunil Vijay Ratna while the Opposition proposed the name of George Pereira. When the vote to elect the Chairman was called, Opposition Councillor Kitsri Khartapide raised a point of order. He pointed out that it was illegal to call a vote without ringing the Council bell. Provincial Minister Nimal Lansa rose at this occasion and voiced his agreement for the recall of a vote. <laughs> UNP Councillor George Pereira received 37 votes, while UPFA Councillor Sunil Vijay Ratna received 60 votes and was elected chairman with a majority of 23 votes. <laughs> Subsequently, the government proposed the name of UPFA Councillor Yasapala Korolege for the position of Deputy Chairman, while the opposition proposed the name of Democratic Party Group Leader Susil Kendal Pitiya. Susil Kendal Pitiya received 33 votes, while Yasapala Korolege received 61 votes and was elected Deputy Chairman with a majority of 28 votes. <laughs> We wish to make a mention of the shortcomings, needs, aspirations and anger faced by the Tamil people. At the same time, at every instance, we have looked at ways in which to live together with other ethnic and religious communities. The primary problem is the national problem and that must be resolved. We wish to express our gratitude to the people of the Western Province for having faith in our party and giving us this opportunity. At times, Honourable Chairman, we can see the people's wish to see good governance through the results. These results have shown us their opposition to wastage and corruption. Thereby, Honourable Chairman, if in the future populist programs which ensure the people's welfare are introduced, as a democratic party, we will unconditionally support such measures.
We have arrived at a decision that instead of standing as a common or joint opposition, the six councillors in the JVP group will stand as a separate opposition group. We will express our agreement, disagreement or silence on proposals of both the government and the opposition on a case-by-case -case basis. <laughs> As an opposition, we feel that we have been treated unjustly when it comes to our swearing-in. Our swearing-in ceremony had been organized at the Bandaranaik International Conference Hall, but we were later informed that it was postponed and then annulled. At the same time, when we brought Councillor Royce Fernando here, we requested that he be allowed to vote and then leave, but he was not allowed to do so. Although some councillors may have been inconvenienced over personal issues, today as per the instructions of the governor, all councillors were sworn in maintaining their respect. I made a statement about Royce Fernando, but I believe this could be mistakenly constructed in the media. I believe that he was granted leave only to be sworn in and not to participate in the sitting. I believe that in the end we receive the support of the UMP councillors. I wish to express my gratitude to those councillors that supported us. During a meeting with President Mahindra Rajapaksa yesterday at Temple Trees, Special Envoy and former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, Yu Myung Hwan, said Sri Lanka has made major strides in progress since the war ended. The presidential spokesperson and international media unit said that the reintegration of former LTTE cadres and the very swift return of internally displaced persons are two examples. Myung Hwan cited as the post-war progress that can be seen in the country. He further stated that the government is to be commended for conducting the first ever election to the Northern Provincial Council in a free and fair manner, as well as establishing the presidential commission on missing persons. The communique issued by the presidential spokesperson and international media unit said that President Rajapaksa had said he is waiting for the report of the commission to consider what further action may be required. On to other local news, UPFA member of the Mahyangani Pradesh Sabha, Venerable Vataraka Vijitathera, was faced with protest at the Pradesh Sabha when he attended a council meeting today. A large group had gathered at the entrance to the premises of the Pradesh Sabha. A group of people had engaged in a protest at the entrance of the Pradesh Sabha premises since this morning. Police officers had been deployed to provide security as a council meeting was to be held. Venerable Vataraka Vijitathera entered the council meeting using the back entrance. <laughs> Our reporter says that the council meeting proceeded as usual after the terror entered the chamber with police protection. However, a large group gathered at the entrance of the Pradesh Sabha and protested against the terror. Following the adjournment of the meeting, Venerable Vataraka Vijitathera left the Pradesh Sabha premises with police protection. Numerous homes were damaged by gale force winds that blew across several villages in Mahava, Kurunagala last evening. Our reporter says that a woman was killed in a lightning strike in Galgamo yesterday. The Met Department is forecasting more showers in several parts of the island tonight as well, owing to the prevailing inter-monsoonal weather system. The department calls on the public to take precautionary measures to prevent lightning-related accidents. 
A woman was killed in a lightning strike when a thunder shower fell over the Padipan Chava area in Kalgamo last evening. A reporter says she was standing in front of her house when she was struck by lightning. The deceased has been identified as 25-year-old Achala Siromani. Three or four of us came running here and found her fallen on the ground with her head between her legs. Her mother had collapsed inside the house. The woman's mother-in-law, who was in shock, was admitted to the Galgamo Base Hospital. Gale force winds accompanied by heavy showers caused damages to 13 homes in the villages of Kumukweva, Yadigama, Dilweva, Mankaduwaweva, Kombakdawala oh. and Randanigama, which comes under the purview of the Mahava Divisional Secretariat. My other son dragged me into the corner and covered me. The winds blew the house down, the roof flew over from our heads. The Kaikalava Rajamahavi area in Kumukweva was also damaged by the winds. Officials of the Disaster Management Unit of the Mahava Divisional Secretariat visited the affected villages today and assessed the damages caused. Incidentally, a buffalo was killed in a lightning strike in the village of the Makadu River. The sixth stage of the Indian general election will work off in the southern state of Tamil Nadu on Thursday. Now campaigning in the state of Tamil Nadu concludes today. Indian election officials saying that special security arrangements have been made in Tamil Nadu state effective from 6 p.m. this evening to the 24th, the day after tomorrow. While Tamil Nadu has an estimated population of about 72 million, about 53.7 million are eligible to vote the day after tomorrow. Of the 543 seats in the Lok Sabha, the state of Tamil Nadu has 39. Political analysts say that the election will be key in contest as usual between the Dravid Munnetra Kalaham and the All India Anna Dravidya Munnetra Kalam, but point out that minor parties may cause an upset. The Marumalachi Dravidya Munnetra Kalaham and the Desya Mupok Dravidya Kalaham are contesting the election together with the main national opposition, BJP. Now, News First has been comprehensively covering the elections since the dates of the polls were announced. Now we have our correspondents based in New Delhi, Chennai and Karnataka. Our bureau correspondent based in New Delhi is A. Walamarthi. He joins us now for more on the very latest. The parliamentary elections for the Tamil Nadu parliamentary constituency will be held on April 24th. It is uh, a unique in, a sense, in, in the sense that for the first time since 1977, the two main parties the DMK and the ADMK have not formed alliance with any of the All India Party, Congress and or BJP. And uh, also the CPI and CPM have been left alone to contact. So this parliamentary uh, election in Tamil Nadu, uh, DMK, AIDMK, Congress, CPI and CPM all contest the election on their own ground this will show the real share of votes for the Congress, CPI and CPM. Now, while the Congress and the BJP may be the two major political forces in India, in the southern state of Tamil Nadu, the political powerhouses are the Dravida Munnetra Kalaham, or DMK, and the All India Anna Dravida Munnetra Kalaham, or AIADMK, a breakaway faction of the original DMK. While one would be hard-pressed to find ideological differences between the two populist Dravidian parties, more often than not, both parties find themselves at loggerheads over various issues. Let's take a look at a brief profile of both parties. The Dravida Munnetra Kalangam, or Dravidian Progress Foundation, a former member of the current UPA government, is a state political party in the states of Tamil Nadu and Puducherry, India. Since 1969, the DMK has been headed by M. Karunanidhi. The DMK holds the distinction of being the first party other than the Indian National Congress to win state-level elections with a clear majority on its own in any state in India. The DMK has had an erstwhile relationship with the Indian central government, having followed a secessionist ideology in its early days. The DMK heads into the current general election looking to redeem itself following defeat at the hands of the AIA DMK at the state assembly elections. The AIA DMK is the current ruling party in the Tamil Nadu State Assembly and is headed by Jayalalitha Jairam, the current Chief Minister. 
The IADMK was founded by the popular Tamil actor M.G. Ramachandran, popularly known as M.G.R., in 1972 as a breakaway faction of the DMK. Since Jayalalitha took over the AIA DMK following a power struggle with MGR's wife Janaki Ramachandran, the party swept to power in the 1991 assembly elections. Power has switched hands several times since then between the DMK and the AIA DMK, and Jayalalitha finds herself once again as the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu and in a position of strength to influence any government that will assume office following the election. The AIA DMK heads into the general election with many predicting that it will win at least 20 of the 39 Lok Sabha seats from Tamil Nadu. The Around the World team, who are on a goodwill tour to promote the upcoming World Conference on Youth 2014, which is to be held in May this year, is currently in Rome, Italy. News First Ramesh Irugal Bandara brings us more details on the day's proceedings. Around the World in 40 Days. What you see behind me is the Colosseum. It is the icon when it comes to Rome and Italy. Now, hundreds of thousands of people gathered here in this very structure that was built during the Roman times to watch gladiator fights. Built of concrete and stone, the Colosseum was the largest amphitheater of the Roman Empire and is considered one of the greatest works of Roman architecture and engineering. The Colosseum could hold an estimated crowd of 80,000 spectators and was used for public spectacles such as mock sea battles, animal hunts, executions and reenactments of famous battles. Meanwhile, the official Italian flag was handed over to the Around the World delegation yesterday by an Italian youth delegate that will attend the conference in Colombo. The official ceremony in Rome was spearheaded by Sri Lankan ambassador to Rome, Navalagay Bennett Kure. There is a great change taking place in our country. The youth community not only sees this change, but to also proactively work to this development forward. What we expect from the World Conference on Youth is to be able to gather the youth of the world and be able to spread this message. Uh, we are going to participate to an event, which is the World Conference of Youth, uh, that will be, I, I believe that will be uh, uh, more and more important uh, during the years. So this is the beginning of a new project, on a, on, of a new young project, and we believe very, very much in it, and it's fundamental. The new year celebrations organized by the Sri Lankan Embassy here in Rome, Italy, has begun. We will have more details on the celebrations that are being held here in Rome tomorrow. For the News First team, I'm Ramesh Shirugal Bandara with Yasrat Kamasiri from Rome, Italy. In related news, Minister of Youth Affairs and Skills Development Dallas Alahad Peruma engaged in an inspection tour of the Magampura Ruhunu International Convention Center, the venue of the opening ceremony of the World Conference on Youth 2014. The opening ceremony of the 15th World Conference on Youth is to be held on the 6th of May. The purpose of this inspection tour was to look into the preliminary preparations for the opening ceremony and the facilities at the convention center. Extensive discussions were held on preparations at the convention center under the auspices of the minister and the organizing committee at the administrative building of the Hambantada Pradesh Sabha. Subsequently, the group visited the Magampura Runa International Convention Center. The theme of the World Conference on Youth 2014 is mainstreaming youth in the post-2015 development agenda. As of last night, representatives of 106 countries, including the ministers of youth affairs of 27 countries and several high-ranking UN officials led by the President of the General Assembly, have confirmed their participation at the World Conference on Youth. We have not seen the designs of cities dedicated to the youth in most cities in Asia, but His Excellency the President has decided that the city of Magam Ruhunpura in Hambantota will be dedicated to the youth. It will be a city of youth. On the night of the 9th, the World Youth Community that will gather in Sri Lanka will present their final declaration to the Head of State, His Excellency President Mahindra Rajapaksa, the Colombo Declaration. We believe that it will become the only document to outline the agenda of the world youth community for several decades from 2014. Convening a media briefing today, UNP parliamentarian Sajid Premadasa commented on the actions of Sri Lanka cricket. 
I believe that the distasteful attack by Sri Lanka cricket itself on two respected national players is a malicious act. It is akin to telling them that since they have won the World Cup, they will be brought before disciplinary committee. The actions taken by Sri Lanka cricket to transform the lions that brought us victory into wolves and monkeys is to be condemned. I wish to say to Sri Lanka cricket that at this time they should not be holding disciplinary inquiries into Kumar Sangakkara and Mahala Javadana, but that they should rather speak to the rulers of this country and take steps to confer on both of them the title of national heroes. <laughs> Today marks the 77th birth anniversary of the late Reji Ranatunga, a prominent Sri Lankan politician. Several memorial events were held across the Gampa district today to commemorate the occasion. A group including members of late Reggie Ranatunga's family gathered in Udugampula Minuangoda to pay floral tributes to the statue of the politician located here. Even today, these people show gratitude for the service that he rendered as an MP and as a minister, not only for this area, but for the entire country. The people have given us their blessings. Although we are on different sides in politics, we hope to strengthen and take forward our father's program. The main commemorative event for the late Reggie Ranatunga was held subsequently at the auditorium of the Japalavata Sonal Education Office in Minuangoda. An event was organized to distribute nutritional supplements to 750 pregnant mothers in Udugampala in line with the late Reggie Ranatunga's birth anniversary. On a sober note, former group director of the Capital Maharaj Organization Limited, Neil Chanmugam, passed away this evening. Neil Chanmugam was a proud product of St. Thomas's College, Mount Lavinia, and was also a renowned senior cricketer. A talented right arm bowler, Chanmugam represented Sri Lanka from 1960 to 1970. He played for the Mercantile Sports Club and the Sri Lanka Cricket Board Chairman's Eleven. The final rites of Neil Chanmugam will be observed at the Borala Public Cemetery on Thursday at 4 p.m. In more local news, applications for national universities for the academic year 2013-2014 for students who pass the 2013 GCE Advanced Level Examination will be called from, t from tomorrow. Chair of the University Grants Commission, Professor Shanika Hibure Gama, issuing a communique said the booklet inclusive of the application form can now be purchased from the UGC and authorized dealers. The communique adds that the closing date for the accepting of nominations is the 19th of May 2014. With that, we're going for Action TV. A group of farmers who arrived at the Anuradhapura District Secretariat today to submit their complaints over the failure to carry out a promise made to them by the Minister of Agriculture seven months ago at the District Farmers Organization meeting under the auspices of the District Secretary were made to face the forcible actions of the security guards at the District Secretariat. In August last year, Action TV exposed the problems being faced by these farmers who are from the Hudluwawa scheme. The problem in question was that the farmers who on the recommendation of the then secretary to the Ministry of Agriculture cultivated soybeans using seeds recommended by him were unable to reap the expected yield. The then secretary to the Ministry of Agriculture currently functions as the secretary to the Ministry of Special Projects which has been tasked with halting the spread of kidney disease in the Rajarata region. Action TV also pointed out that the economic cost to the country of the situation being faced by the 1,500 farmers in Hurulwewa, which was the platform for the spread of soybean cultivation in the country in the 1980s, was about 400 million rupees. Following the Action TV expose on the 8th of August, the Minister of Agriculture visited the Hurulwewa scheme, where he witnessed firsthand the substandard quality of the seeds recommended by the Agriculture Secretary, whereupon, with the agreement of the supplier of the seeds, who was also present at the occasion, he promised the farmers that they would be recompensed for crop damage. The farmers too agreed to make a considerable sacrifice at this occasion. The farmers decided to halve their usual minimal harvest of 1,200 kilograms per hectare using their own seeds. However, on the 17th of September, Action TV revealed that various unjust conditions were being imposed on the group of farmers selected to receive compensation. On the 21st of January, the farmers stormed the Galen Bindunwava Divisional Secretariat, citing the halting of the compensation payments. 
A group of representatives of the farmers were then called to the Ministry of Agriculture, where the subject minister agreed to make compensation payments as promised earlier from the 22nd of February. Today, the district secretary was made to offer a response to the complaints raised by the farmers who did not receive any compensation even with the coming of the new year. Thanks, uh, million we have received 110 million so far and preparations have been made to provide compensation to all those affected by the substandard soya. Thereby, you do not have a problem. <laughs> Come to my office with three representatives by noon and I will clear all of this for you. While three representatives were granted the opportunity to meet with the district secretary as promised at 3 p.m., it was revealed during discussions that although the district secretary said a sum of 110 million rupees had been received to pay compensation, the actual amount was only 6.3 million rupees. If compensation payments are to be made, as per the promise made by the Agriculture Minister on the 8th of August last year, a further sum of 4.5 million rupees will be required. An agreement was reached today that when funding is received, compensation payments would be made to all affected farmers at once. Will the farmers receive justice through the third agreement reached within a seven-month period? Action TV will keep a close watch. On to business news, the Monetary Board of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka has decided to maintain the policy repurchase and reverse repurchase rates unchanged. The Central Bank says the decision was made in order to increase credit flow to the private sector. In its monetary policy statement for the month of April, the Central Bank says that it decided to maintain the repo and reverse repo rates at 6.5 and 8% respectively. The statement reads that inflation was maintained at mid-single-digit figures in spite of a drop in supply brought on by dry weather conditions experienced thus far this year. As such, the Central Bank notes that it decided to maintain the policy rates unchanged in order to increase credit flow to the private sector and stimulate economic growth. The central bank notes that while credit to the state from the banking system in January and February this year stood at 43.3 billion rupees, it is expected that this figure will reduce in the future as a result of the government opting to raise funds through sovereign bond issues. In international news tonight, the South Korean Coast Guard said the death toll of South Koreans, of South Koreans capsized ferry reached 117 as of 600 GMT today. South Korean Coast Guards sped up, sped up search operations under better weather conditions. Search operations ended its seven day for the nearly 200 missing passengers on the South Korean ferry that capsized. Early in the day, the South Korean Ferry Coast Guard confirmed at least 87 passengers were found dead, but local media said the confirmed death toll was 104. Of the 476 passengers and crew on board, 339 were teenagers and teachers on a high school outing. Only 174 people have been rescued and the remainder are all presumed to have drowned. South Korean Coast Guard said it will be speeding up search operations under better weather conditions. The Sibol ferry sank last Wednesday on a routine trip south from the port of Incheon to the subtropical holiday island of Jeju. <laughs> South Korean police and volunteers working near the site on the sunken ferry expressed their sympathy for the devastated families of the passengers missing after ferry Sibol capsized. South Korean officials are still characterizing the operation as a rescue, although marine experts say that it is unlikely that there are any survivors. And on a greener note, today marks Earth Day. Earth Day 2014 will offer opportunities to learn about protecting the environment. This year's theme is Green Cities and will focus on mobilizing millions of people to create a sustainable healthy environment by greening communities worldwide. News First takes a closer look at the significance of commemorating Earth Day. Earth Day is a day that is intended to inspire awareness and appreciation for the Earth's natural environment. The day was founded by United States Senator Gaylord Nelson as an environmental teaching first held on the 22nd of April 1970. In 2009, the United Nations designated the 22nd of April as International Mother Earth Day. 
over the years. Although the world celebrates Earth Day, there has been no stop to the felling of trees across the world and the killing of wild animals. Earth Day is a reminder about the importance of environmental protection and sustainability. Most importantly, it reminds us that we can make a difference when it comes to our planet. And finally on Sports First, Paul Fabres has tendered his resignation as head coach of Sri Lanka cricket, leaving him, to, leaving him free to become assistant to England's new coach, Peter Moores. Sri Lanka cricket announced that Paul Fabres handed in his resignation today. The communique issued by SLC read that Paul Fabres, a former Kent and Middlesex wicketkeeper, had noted in his resignation that he cannot continue to work with SLC. The communique adds that Fabris hopes to work with the England and Wales Cricket Board in the future. And from the pavilion to the dugouts, Namal Rajapaksa was appointed as captain of the Sri Lankan rugby team that will compete at the Asian Five Nations in South Korea. The captain of the seven-a-side rugby team, Fazil Maria Maja, has not been included in the 23-man squad for the Asian Five Nations. Of the 23 players in the squad, 10 are from the Sri Lanka Navy SC, while 7 of the remaining players are from Havelock's SC. Sri Lanka will lock horns against South Korea on Saturday at the Asian Five Nations. The Symphony Orchestra of Sri Lanka is preparing for a chamber music concert that will be held in Colombo this weekend. The concert is the fourth concert of the Earl de Fonseca Chamber Music Concert Series which began four years ago in an effort to promote the appreciation of chamber music. The orchestra consists of 22 musicians including two from India. The concert will feature Tchaikovsky's String Serenade, Mozart's Divertimento in D as well as Hasita Patiran performing Handel's Oboe Concerto. The chamber music concert will be held on the 26th of this month. And with that, we conclude tonight's edition of Primetime News. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Mahina Bongzo. And I'm Nadim Majid. Good night and good luck. Hotline 0114 896 896. www.newsfirst.lk. Feedback at newsfirst.lk.